Elizabeth, your mother's 91 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and does she still give you counsel? Uh, is, she, uh, is she ever watchful, or is she kind of now accepted that maybe you've grown up? Well, she's accepted the fact that I'm sort of uh, an adult now. But she, like all mothers, is ever watchful. She's mm -hmm. 91 and so sharp, so on the ball. But she doesn't sort of try and guide my life anymore. She thinks you know, I should make my own mistakes. When you were a child working in film, she wouldn't let you go to the bathroom alone. Oh, the studio wouldn't. I had a caretaker, practically, following me everywhere. When did she finally stop worrying about Elizabeth? Do you remember? Uh, I think when I was married to Mike Todd, she realized that I was finally a grown-up girl. She must... You talked about the pain of this terrible mistake of a marriage with uh, uh, Nikki Hilton. And you were very young, and the marriage lasted... I don't know, a year or something. She must have been very, very troubled as you were. Well, she was, and she read uh, accounts of it in the papers, which were all distorted, about Nikki throwing chips in my face at the casino and slapping me, all of which were exaggerated. But I was in Europe, and she was in California, and it must have been very hard on her. Do you remember when, it, when you first saw her and you said, Mom, it's over, or to, was she gl happy to get you out of this, or... Did she see it coming? I mean, you know, mothers are pretty smart. Did she look at him and yeah, say... Yeah, I, I think she did. But when I made my decision, I went and stayed with a friend downtown L.A. where no one would think of looking at me. And I thought about it for about four days, and no one could find me. And then I made my decision public to my family. I assume that your mother was your most difficult uh, message, was it? I mean, you didn't want to hurt her. Perhaps not. You didn't want to hurt anybody, but... Was it hard for you to tell your mom that, that, that this was going to end, this marriage? No, because I think she already instinctively knew that uh, bad things were going on, bad things that I won't even begin to get into. They were just, um, they were worse than unpleasant. As, you, as one reads your uh, book, I can't say that anybody would be necessarily uh, surprised that your first outing, your first marriage, would not be successful. Let me try and explain this. And I think you may agree. You were really in a very, very strange situation. You were, here you, you are now and were then this drop dead beautiful creature who was expected to create an erotic illusion on film at age 17, 18, 19, I don't know how old you were, with Robert Taylor. 16. 16. You were playing, here you were with this 22 inch waist, very busty, gorgeous and you were a virgin you that was a rarity in Hollywood I can tell you that uh, but being a virgin creating these adult illusions on the air having to go to school coming into your own full flower I'm surprised you survived any of it don't when you look back on that isn't that wasn't that a, um, nobody meant it to be cruel but it had to be you wouldn't do this to It was uh, very confusing for me. And I think that's the, the reason I married so early, was to get away from all the supervision, to find out what life was about for myself and begin living it for myself. And I thought the only respectable way I could do it was by, Mar by getting married. And many girls my age did marry at 18. I, I thought I was in love, too. It was sort of a Prince Charming... Um, just sort of storybook romance. Right. And just when you get to, just when I thought I figured you out, normally a person uh, and who is this sheltered and uses marriage to get out of the house, you're not the first woman to do that. Uh, at the same time, you were telling Louis B. Mayer to go to hell. <laughs> Where'd you get that? Where'd you get that kind of fire? What a smart... I guess I, I, guess I was uh, just born with that. I was always a rebel. And it really didn't matter to me. I wasn't that ambitious. It didn't matter to me whether I had a career or not. What did matter to me was my own personal integrity and my own sense of identity. That's always been very important to me. I think that's why, as a child, I would go riding instead of playing with uh, my peers. And, like, I really didn't have kids my own age as friends. 
Well, you're not unlike then a lot of uh, child stars in that you're, uh, you had, I guess you'd have to say, no, no childhood. But you seem to survive this better than a lot of others. I think I enjoyed it. Uh, I loved writing. I loved being introspective. I, I loved the fantasy world that I was thrown into. And I could separate it from reality. And I think I was very lucky in, uh, in my parents reminding me of that all the time. You know, that one world was real and the other was fantasy. Like when it, it, somebody would pay me a compliment. Uh, if somebody would say, oh my God, you have such beautiful eyes, my mother would say, Elizabeth, remember, always remember, it's the expression in your eyes, not your eyes, they're just eyes. It's the expression, what you're feeling. But you were blocking your real self, weren't you? I mean, I don't see how you can really get in touch with your feelings, to use that old expression when you're surrounded by males who want to put you in the proper light and change your face and your hair and ah uh... that's so much I, I would get away and it was me and the animal and i'd commute with nature and that way i could hold onto myself mm -hmm. the core of me you talk about a felipe halsman is that his name he was he a photographer mm -hmm. he's a still photographer Famous one. He, uh, he made you uh, first appreciate your own adult beauty. Is, is that how I should interpret your point? Well, I'd never really been aware of one side or the other side. I thought both sides were the same on one's face. I hadn't stopped to think that they were different. I hadn't stopped to analyze my features. How old were you this face time? A face is a face. Sixteen. And it was like the first time I'd worn a very sophisticated evening dress and somebody did my makeup and hair it was for Life magazine squeezed in my waist and he told me which side was my grown-up side and which side was my younger side and which side was my better side well the one that made me look grown up was the side I liked the best because I always wanted to be older than I was mm -hmm. When we asked you to be seated here, we gave you the choice of chairs, and you said either one. Actually, if it, this is my best angle back here. You don't mean that. <laughs> uh, you, you're not self-conscious then about your side as you enjoy your 55th uh, year. No. True. Uh, which side, curiously, is your best side, in I your really opinion? don't know. Uh, well, which side is your younger side then, according to Halsman? And this side is your more mature side. Mm -hmm. And they tried to get the uh, beauty mark too, didn't they? I guess so. Wouldn't let them? Oh, they wanted to cut it off, have it removed. And you have double eyelashes. They thought you had mascara as a child, and you didn't. Oh, I used to, before I started every film, have to go to the ladies' room with um, somebody from the set, the script woman or somebody, and wash my eyes to prove that I didn't have mascara They also didn't like your hair. It was too black and would shoot red. They said it would photograph blue-black, and they wanted to make it dark brown. They wanted to change the shape of my mouth mm -hmm. because uh, Joan Crawford's mouth was very in, mm -hmm. and lips were sort of square and painted way over the natural mouth. Now, this was before National Velvet, so you didn't have that much Well, color. no, because uh, I didn't wear any makeup. This is when I was about 14 and started wearing makeup because I, I looked about... 16 to 17. Mm -hmm. I didn't really go through a transitional period. I went from child to young adult ingenue, then to leading lady when I was still a baby, really, 16. Mm -hmm. I also, um, I, I mean, everyone has to be, as they read the book, impressed with the, the fortitude to say no. What? Ch child would have the nerve to say no to the Hollywood establishment. Did you get that from your mom or your dad? Where did this uh, independent uh, security come from? I think, well, I, I should probably say both of them, but um, my dad was a very proud man. And a lot of the uh, Celtic stubbornness and pride, I think, came from my dad. This pride uh, that you speak of uh, quite a bit in your book has also manifested itself many, many times in your adulthood. Um, 
you have paid your dues. I think you're proud of that. And your dues include a good deal of public commentary, not all of it positive. Mm -hmm. You've had times in your own life as a highly visible woman, not unlike Ingrid Bergman. The Vatican was on your case. The papacy. You never hid. I'm sure you had your retreats, but you never hid. Where'd that come from? Is that the Celtic uh, heritage as well? I think so. You can't hide from yourself, so why hide from the world? Oh, I think it'd be easier to hide. I mean, you must... They get you in the end. You felt that way? No mm -hmm. sense? So I felt like, okay, you're after me, here I am. Uh, it was a bit of, sort of, a bit of Mike Todd, too. I jutted my jaw and stood my ground. That really attracted you about him, didn't it? Mm. You went to the altar as a virgin for your first, married, first marriage. And not too many years later, here you were with a man who you admired his confidence. So this man appeared to be afraid of nothing, huh? Yeah. You liked that. I'm impressed with the uh, transition, weren't you? From, from being it somebody that everybody wanted you to be to deciding that you liked this kind of swaggering lifestyle. It probably was the beginning of a kind of uh, a typical behavior to go from uh, a weak man to a strong man. You go to a weak man to a strong man. I've done that a couple of times in my life. Uh, I assume you've gone the reverse as well, from a strong man to a weak man. Yeah. How do you explain that? I don't know. That's difficult for me now to explain because I know that a weak man um, doesn't belong in my life. I need a strong man. Uh, and there are not that very many men uh, around, you know, at my age, that feel they can be strong enough with me. And I need that. I know I need that. Mm -hmm. Because I know myself very well and I think I'll push uh, just as far as I can. If you're tired of hunting for your vacuum cleaner's attachments, get the new Dirt Devil Upright. It's lightweight, easy to use, and all the attachments are built right into the vacuum. So you can clean everything from floor to ceiling and edge to edge without stopping to find a thing. And because it's a Dirt Devil, it's packed with plenty of cleaning power. So stop hunting for your attachments. Get the new Dirt Devil Upright, the all-in-one cleaner that cleans it all. Your pets go many places during the course of a day, and you can't always protect them when they go into flea and tick infested areas. We can. Used as directed, Hearts Blockade for Dogs and Cats repels and kills fleas and ticks, including ticks that carry Lyme disease. By creating a barrier, Hearts Blockade prevents these pests from living on your pets. Helping to improve your pet's quality of life is your responsibility. Helping you do that is Hearts. When the people at Save-On develop your film, they correct the exposure, the color, and more. You just might get back better pictures than you took. At Save-On, count on people who care. Hurry in for Circuit City's 4th of July weekend sale. And save on this Magnavox VCR with remote, now a low $197. This JVC Car Stereo CD player, just $299 installed. And this Hotpoint 14.7 cubic foot refrigerator, only $324 after $125 SCE rebate. Don't miss the 4th of July weekend sale, going on now at Circuit City. Welcome to Circuit City, where service is state-of-the-art. You uh, appear to be doing very well at the moment without any man at all. I am. You it's smile great. as you say that. Yeah, I'm having a ball. <laughs> well, I wonder what... Uh, I assume you wish this uh, ball would have happened sooner. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, well, it's the first time in my life, really, that I've had a sort of period to do what most women do in their teens or early 20s. I'm doing it all now. I'm doing sort of crazy things like going biking and air ballooning and uh, dating and actually blind dating. Oh! <laughs> Serious? I've had a couple of blind dates. 
Uh, so it's all kind of like crazy adventure backwards, but it's fun. Uh, are you here to say that you that the doorbell rings and you don't know who's out there with the flowers to go out for the evening? Well, friends will have set it up. Actually, John Warner was a blind date. Mm -hmm. The um, ambassador, the English ambassador in Washington, mm -hmm. um, invited me to a party that the Queen was giving for the president, right. a reciprocal party. And she invited me because I'm British and asked me who I wanted as an escort. And I said, I don't know anyone here. But find somebody, for God's sake, for instance. Mm -hmm. She said, well, do you know Mr. Bicentennial? I said, I think I've seen him around. Couldn't remember what he looked like. Mm -hmm. And she said, I think you'll like him. And he's a bachelor and blah, blah, blah. So that was really kind of a blind day. You must sympathize with, or empathize, I don't think you sympathize, or empathize with the single divorced woman who may not be 25 years old today who may be past 30 or 40. I certainly do. We seem to be very, almost cruel to, uh, the culture does not, as now that I think of it, I don't know how you would uh, necessarily, uh, maybe a blind date is the most practical way for you to enjoy an evening out. And if that's true, that's really too bad. The culture shouldn't do this to single women. Well, no, uh, th that isn't true. I hate blind dates, really. Um, but sometimes, you have to trust your friends. And if they know somebody that they think you'll get along with, um, it's either sit at home and watch TV or take a chance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not important to you that you have a date. You're comfortable on Saturday night now without one. I assume you... I'm usually pretty busy. Um, I don't find it a problem. But it, this can be a very rough town for women. Most of the men are, uh, most of the attractive men are married. Not you, Phil. Thank you. So inconsiderate of you. Well, I'm very flattered. <laughs> I will say that, uh, just from a political perspective, you impress everyone you meet as being very happy, very centered. But as you look back on your own career, do you ever feel just a little bit uh, angry at all the money you brought in for all those men with the cigars. No. They're wealthier than you are. That doesn't bother me. No, uh, at the time, the thing that did bother me was being treated like a commodity. Um, I finally got away from MGM and was one of the first ones to start my own company and make my own deals and go without an agent. And I enjoyed dealing with the studios and telling them where to go. Uh, that was nice. And I was quite a good businesswoman. Uh, you say was. You must consider yourself a businesswoman now. Well, yeah. And uh, pardon this preoccupation with, uh, I think you must understand it and you'll bear up. Marriage is not in sight and that's okay for you? I mean, do you expect that... Uh... I think I'll probably get married again one day before I die, but there's nobody in sight, there's nobody in mind. But it wouldn't surprise me if it happened. It wouldn't surprise me if it didn't happen. But you are at this moment more comfortable single than you've ever been in your life. I assume you would say that. Is that so? Yeah. It's... Did you, didn't you? did you have to be married? Weren't you kind of a marriage... Yes. ...needful? It was like, you know, if you fell in love and were close to someone, it was automatic that you got married. That and was the way I was brought up. That was, uh, those were my morals, and it just, no matter <laughs> how old I got, it was still like, you know, I had to uh, legalize it. Uh -huh. And that, that, uh, that uh, attitude lasted up through John Warner. Yeah. And it's different now. I'm trying to grow up. Is that how you see it growing up? Being more independent and more sure of myself, yes. Not so dependent on having a man around. You're size six, true? Um, you lost 60 pounds. We don't get a whole lot of information about any particular agonies that you might have sustained during this 60 pound loss. I mean, were there moments when you said, I can't do this? No. Once I made up my mind, once I got the click, as I call it, um, it was just another 
adventure. I was so determined by then that I was going to do it, and I did it. And then, you know, the fun, the, the rewards. But it was just three years ago. You were sitting in Georgetown, staring at the walls. Mrs. Senator, you hated it. You had nobody to talk to. You were married to a workaholic. Uh, you didn't like yourself. You pigged out. You also drank. You took Valley. This is three, this is not that long ago. And look at you today. This is a, uh, this is a stunning uh, transformation here. Look at this. Well, I did it all by myself, which is another reason, probably, that I feel good about myself. You, you don't mind looking at that, do you? I chose these to go in the book. The uh, publisher said, Elizabeth, don't be so hard on yourself. Those are really ugly. Do you want to see? Yes. Don't do that. And you chose them because it motivated you, is that it? Uh, when I looked at these pictures, I thought, that can't be me. Um, I don't recognize that person. I mean, the eyes are buried in a bowl of suet, the chins and my b b b b bosom like meat. Yeah. Um, I, I couldn't see myself in there. And where was my head when my eyes were looking in the mirror that I couldn't see that? I notice a picture, too, of you crowning a uh, young teenage queen of something in Virginia as, as Mrs. John Warner. And you were heavy, very heavy. Heavy? I, I was a boiling piece. <laughs> you didn't know that? I mean, how were you able to go up there and crown this beautiful young size for herself? And uh, you what? I was in denial. I, uh, I didn't want to see that. I guess like an anorexic doesn't see... Uh, her belsonic skeleton. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a eating disorder. You don't see yourself. You don't see the obesity. Just like an anorexic doesn't see the uh, skinniness. And I'm obviously, by the way I took care of my hair and the way I dressed, I didn't pay much attention to how I looked, so I avoided the mirror. <laughs> Know how to protect yourself before, during, and after a disaster strikes. Send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Earthquake Guide, Burbank 91523. Have you seen this? It's Healthline magazine, and it rates Nutrisystem number one out of 16 popular diet regimens, the only one they gave a perfect score. Does that surprise me? Not at all. They're already number one with me because only Nutrisystem helped me take off 25 pounds. Come on, give Nutrisystem a call. The only thing you've got to lose, you'll lose. Now join Nutrisystem. Only $39 for an introductory program. Call 1-800-321-THIN. Let's talk about washing your old man's underwear. <laughs> now, just because he won't part with those raggedy old stretched out, waistband barely hanging on, been wearing the same pair since he was in high school underwear, means you got to be embarrassed when you go to the laundromat? Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Not when you can get your own washer dryer from your Get It Today store. RTO Rent to Own. RTO's got a full-size washer and dryer, both for just $18.99 a week. Free delivery today, $18.99. Look us up in the white pages under RTO. Kearns invites you to drink an apricot on your yacht. Drink a bite of Kearns Nectar. Kearns Nectars have so much whole fruit goodness, it's like drinking a bite of fruit. Drink a bite of Kearns Nectar. And now you can drink all the fruit you can pour. Kearns refrigerated half gallons are new in your store. Look for our full quart glass bottles too. Drink a bite of Kearns Nectar. We don't no, we don't hear too much, Elizabeth, in this book about your shaking the booze, not an inconsiderable challenge. Now, I say in the very beginning that this book is about one addiction, my addiction to food, and I also explain why uh, I don't go in-depth about the alcohol and the pills, because that is a whole separate volume and a very serious book. But you did this all at the... Well, first you kicked the booze. You detox, is that how we say it? Yeah. And then you went to work on your body, is that how it About three months after. Uh -huh. Because they encourage you when you're at the center only to do one thing at a time. Uh -huh. And when I felt secure enough in my sobriety, I decided that I felt so great inside uh, that I wanted the outside to match the interior, that they were at conflict with each other. 
and I wanted to feel outside as good as I felt inside. Uh, and don't preach to a fatty. You can't preach. No one could say to you, Elizabeth, you have to go on a diet. The more anybody say that to you, you go right for the ice cream. I think. Oh, yeah. I would just become recalcitrant, put my heels in. Uh -huh. On the issue of the intervention, you were in the hospital when your family gathered around the bed. And as I understand intervention, one of the responsibilities of the family members is to share with the loved one some incident that was humiliating or to remind the uh, person that they really do have a drinking problem. It's called tough love, and it is. It must have been awful. It was amazing. Uh, Roddy McDowell was there, and he said that I became absolutely silent, and my mouth sort of opened as if I were about to gasp for air, and that I didn't say anything for about two hours, except, please leave me alone for a couple of hours. It has to be my decision. May I gently ask for just a piece of of your memory of what was it that hurt especially did, did a child one of your children say something that you didn't realize you would hurt them or uh, what oh, is it I think the uh, guilt that I had caused my children such pain like what being late or not being sure no, um, that they worried so much about me whether I would survive or not um, so that they'd have to help pick me up off the floor after I'd taken sleeping pills on top of booze. How much pain I could see in their faces, and I had caused that. I'd inflicted that, and it killed me. You were taking Valium, sleeping pills, and Jack Daniel all at once? I didn't get drunk. It would be after I'd taken the sleeping pills, the mixture of the sleeping pills, and the booze, and then I'd go zonk. So you were never a sloppy kind of... No, no one ever drunk. saw me drunk because uh, I had like hollow legs. And it would be after I'd taken the sleeping pills, a lethal combination. It's a wonder I didn't kill myself. Why do you think you didn't? Well, I took one precaution. I obviously didn't want to die. Um, I would lay out, like in the evening, the amount of sleeping pills and Valium that I would take that night. And if they were gone, I knew I'd swallow them. And I wouldn't say, oh, <laughs> you know, I... So you kept your I own inventory, your audit then? Yeah. To ensure you didn't double dose and... It, which is how people die so um, frequently. You know, the accidental, uh -huh. suicidal death. When did you do this, in the morning? Uh, before I go out or in the evening. Before I was too stoned or sloshed. Uh -huh. So there was something in me that wanted to survive. Mm -hmm. And then at the Betty Ford Clinic, you walked into your cottage. No flowers. No welcome, Elizabeth Taylor. We love you. No paparazzi. You had to cry about that, didn't you? you well, I've never been so lonely in my life. They were all in a meeting or something. And I arrived at nighttime, and usually, um, one of the other patients greets a newcomer and takes them to their room and shows them where to unpack and where to put the clothes and all that. There are two beds in each room. But they were all away someplace, and I was going to detox down there, and I was waiting for the nurse to arrive, and it was like two hours that I sat in this room without anyone to talk to or cry out to or anybody to touch or touch me and find me. I, would, I had visions of Nurse Ratchet arriving and stringing me up. Cuckoo's nurse. Yeah. And finally this darling girl arrived and we became best friends. And she was with me for 10 days. And she, she she's great. She's one of my best friends. And you got up on one occasion you said, I'm Elizabeth Taylor and I'm an addict. And then after so many times of doing this, one day you stood up and you said, I'm Elizabeth Taylor, I'm an addict and an alcoholic. Why is that a significant difference? I mean, because you... Because you, I finally admitted to myself at that moment that I also was an alcoholic. Your skin is vulnerable every day to the aging effects of ultraviolet rays. But now you can defend yourself 
with new UV Daily Defense Body Lotion from Vaseline Intensive Care. Its UV screen defends against age spots and wrinkles. Its patented moisturizer defends against moisture loss. It's your first line of defense every day. New UV from Vaseline Intensive Care. Now you can defend your youth at any age. I can't believe this report is due this afternoon. What is that? Craft-free Italian. You carry Italian dressing in your purse. Hey, I love Italian. Obviously. You want some? No, thank you. No, it's too much fat. Oh, no, this is craft-free. See, fat-free, cholesterol-free. It sounds great. Just try it. Mmm. Craft-free Italian non-fat dressing. Fat-free, cholesterol-free. But feel free to love the taste. Wonder if they make ranch. Mm. But they do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your hair is not some beautiful gown you just toss away when it looks tired or raggedy. No. You give it Pantene. Pantene can take your hair and make it better. Because Pantene has a provitamin formula that penetrates. Your hair gets stronger, shiny, healthy. Don't you see? That's the only head of hair you have. But you can make it the hair you always wanted. There's a Stroud behind Strouds. When a customer walks into our store, her first assumption may be that we're expensive because of the way we look. But we may look expensive, but we're not. We shop our competitors weekly to ensure that we offer every day the lowest prices that you will find anywhere. We don't think of ourselves as a discount store, even though our prices are everyday low prices. Whatever the customer's budget is, they can be assured they'll get the best value for their money. When you think about the unique joy your dog brings you, why would you ever want to feed him anything less than America's finest dog food? New reward. For the very best dogs in the world, what may just be the very best dog food. Michael Todd and Richard Burton get special treatment in your book. No one reading this book can come away without believing that those were the greatest memories of your life. Do I understand uh, what you were intended to say to your readers? Uh, I imagine it does come out that way. <laughs> You're not comfortable, however, uh, talking about it. Um, and yet, once again, we have Elizabeth Stalwart not only having divorced Richard and taken all the hits that the public, that the press and the gossip columnists have to offer, but you went to work with him in private lives. Not that only, was not easy. Well, he was seeing his new lady. Yeah, that, that, was, uh, that wasn't easy. And it was not successful. It was certainly not the, critical. The public success. wanted to see it because they wanted to see Liz and Dick. So they didn't care. Um, we were both miscast, but it didn't seem to matter to the public. For once, the critics lost, and I enjoyed that. The critics had no bearing on whether people came or not. They came. Yes, but... We broke records. Yes, you did, but it wasn't an art form as much as it was a voyeurism on the part of the audience. That had oh, been... yeah. But for two, accomplished two Academy Awards, him with the Shakespearean background and this magnificent voice, that had to be very, at least, non-nutritional. True. And you can tell by the photographs, uh, I started to just gorge out. That's when you started eating mm. you know, both hands, huh? Yeah. Uh, you didn't realize, though. It, it, you must have known you were gaining weight at the time, but you, you were in your Oh, they denial. had to make new costumes for me. I knew. Mm -hmm. But I didn't give it to them. You, 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 all, you also saw him going down the big spiral staircase, booze. Uh, he was very ill. Yeah. There was nothing you could do. Well, the last time I saw him, which was two months before his death, uh, he was so proud of what I'd done. And he was very interested, very inquisitive about what had gone on at the Betty Ford Center and how I'd done it and what the 
process, the procedure was, I think he would have eventually gone. He could have saved himself had his I think so. health held up. Yeah. No one knew that he uh, was that sick. Uh, in your uh, marriage to John Warner, uh, he sold the house without telling you. And then you sold some jewelry. Uh, the sense here is that at the end of that marriage, the most beautiful woman in the world was not in the chips. You had to sell, did you sell the, uh, the prep uh, diamond? Uh-huh. You didn't have to sell it. <laughs> but you did sell, uh, this is, uh, should I guess, 33? Mm -hmm. 33 carats. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Now that, that little baby stays with me. But we have the sense that we have here, this, the royalty of filmdom um, in the center of 20th century film, that's you. And you were not, you, I, I have the feeling you had to watch your checkbook. Is that true? Well, to a certain extent, because I, I retired. I was 100% behind my man. And my man was a senator in Washington, because the state being Virginia. And you were not, you were without income, you're saying? I wasn't working. I was retired. And I was sort of seeking obscurity. And I wanted just to be uh, a Mrs. Senator lady. You were very soon to learn, though, that this was not really something you could do. It, uh, well, the media didn't really allow me to. For some reason, uh, like they were obsessive about my weight. And I, I, I could never understand why or how they thought it was their business. Well, can I argue that? Yeah. Someone with, of your fame and worldwide admiration and renown goes to 180 pounds? It's my body, my life. And it's my column, and I've got to write about it if I'm in the business. That's my point. I'm not saying this necessarily is something that someone like yourself should enjoy, but you've always acknowledged that you were a, Your fame denied you the kind of privacy that goes to most of us. And you seem to be rather resigned to living this way, and yet you got angry when they were commenting on your... Uh, yeah, because I really thought... That was a time when I could be obscure and private and be on the farm in Virginia and try just being a wife. The Terminator, born on the 4th of July, 49 cents every day, only at Music Plus. Do the right thing. Young Guns, 49 cents every day, only at Music Plus. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, The Fabulous Baker Boys, 49 cents every day, only at Music Plus. An American Tale, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, 49 cents every day, only at Music Plus. Thousands of rentals, only 49 cents every day, only at Music Plus. Clean it twice or cinch it once. I don't mind cleaning, but I hate cleaning twice. First spray cleaner to cut grease, then go back with glass cleaner to get the streaks the spray left. Don't clean it twice, cinch it once. New Cinch from Spick and Span. It's the first cleaner that gets the grease and the streaks. Cinch it once and two things happen. The grease is gone and the streaks are gone too. Glass cleaner can't always get the grease, and spray cleaners can leave streaks. Either way, you'd have to clean twice, but New Cinch gets it right the first time. Leaves no grease, leaves no streaks. New Cinch from Spick and Span. Don't clean it twice, cinch it once. She sends them out with hats, which don't come back. She gives them healthy treats, which do come back. So she's giving them something new at breakfast. Citrus Hill 10. Juice from 10 fruits. Do, but she can give them a helping hand. So far, it's working out fine. The extra nutrition of Citrus Hill 10. Healthy kids.
are the real reward. Your fiancé is being rushed to the hospital every second counts when suddenly you're getting married. Everyone screams, surprise, welcome to your wedding. Next Donahue, unbelievable love stories. This was a mail-order romance. There's a lot of people get married this way. You gotta marry them in 90 days or send them back. The most unusual ways to say, I do. Where do you find ambulances that do weddings? Next Donahue, <laughs> right after Santa Barbara at 3, only on Channel 4. Talk about getting out of the bathtub <sighs> uh, and seeing yourself, your body in the mirror. The great white whale. <laughs> Was it really one time like that, that this suddenly? You had yeah. not been looking in the mirror. Yeah, it was. It was like a terrible shock. I really saw myself and then I really looked and it was not pretty. And it was at that moment that you decided to commit to doing something about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I began to look at all kinds of things within myself as to why I was at that desperate place. And I realized I had to do something challenging to survive, that I was slowly going right down the tube. <coughs> so I decided to do a stage play, Little Foxes which I had never done. I've never had an acting lesson. I've never had a voice lesson. I know nothing about projecting, any of that. And Richard, Mike Nichols, everybody said, don't do it, baby, you know. You don't know like, body language for the stage. You don't know how to project. It's a whole different technique. I said, just let me try. Give me a chance. And, well, the first one, Little Foxes, um, that was worked. That worked. Uh, you also got off an airplane on one occasion. You became terrified on the runway. They drove the plane back to the airport. They taxied back to the oh, airport. Yeah. Let you off, and then the plane crashed. Yeah. Do you think you have some sort of? That's happened to me so many times. So you th must think you have it. Have something. Something that I listen to now. If it's so loud that it's a certain knowledge and not just a feeling. You can't go along with just feelings, otherwise I'd never get on a bloody plane. But if it's with a certain knowledge, then I listen to it, and other people listen to it. Mm -hmm. And I've saved several people's lives. Mm -hmm. By anticipating tragedy, including a helicopter on one occasion, uh, does this make you feel a little self-conscious? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's in the book, so I, I mean, I have written about it, but um, it took me a long time to get to the place where I could talk about it because it seems sort of freaky. Mm -hmm. I want to just share with uh, our audience one uh, very brief clip. I assume you enjoy this. I hope so. Um, this is National Velvet, and Mickey is cutting your hair you are going to become, at least cosmetically speaking, a boy so that you can race. I want you to tell me how you feel watching this. National Velvet. Go ahead, Mike. Cut it quite short, it's back. I wish your mother were here. She is here. She's inside me. Velvet, you'll be disqualified at the end when they find out you're a girl. You'll have to forfeit the prize money. They may even send you to prison for fraud. But if there's any trouble, you tell them it was me that did it. You understand? It was me that put you up to it. It was my idea. I made you do it. There won't be any trouble, Mike. If you're going to ride, there's a lot of tricks of the race you'll have to learn. Don't worry about the start. Get off as fast as you can and then jump sure and clean. Yes, Mike. And uh, you go twice around the course. That's 30 jumps in all. Yes, Mike. I might as well start at the beginning. The first jump is a, just a plain hedge Mike. jump. and then. Mike, don't tell me anymore. Well, you've got to know the order of the jumps and the tricks of the race. Why, there's a lot to know. It's no use. Everyone riding out there tomorrow will know more than I do. It's no use, Mike. Do you think a race like this is won by luck? No. By knowing the pie can win and telling him so. <laughs> feel good about it? Do I what? You must feel good watching that. It's, it? like, it's funny. It's like uh, watching somebody else. Um, you... Uh, you talk in your book about what you don't, 
like or what is vulnerable about your own uh, body that someone told you you don't like your arms? No. And, and do you like your legs? Mm, they're not too bad. Uh, do you wish you were taller? Oh, yeah. What about your arms? Is somebody, what is a dead mice uh, metaphor? <laughs> <What is that? laughs> Jill Mankiewicz. When we were doing Suddenly Last Summer, and I was in my 20s, I wasn't really fat but I wasn't sort of toned up. He said, you look like you have a bag of white mice under your arms. <laughs> and that was so disgusting an image, I went and toned up. <laughs> uh, you take that kind of hit, and it hurts a little, but you do something about it, huh? Oh, no, I loved it. I think it's hysterical. Uh -huh. Now, there are some things you don't love. You talked in your book about the indignity of being introduced at a roast in New York as uh, Elizabeth Hilton, Wilding, Todd, that's it's Fisher. That hurts you. Yeah, uh, I should have gotten used to it by now because I've read it, it enough and I've seen it enough. Um, to be reminded over and over and over that one has made mistakes, but I have. And if I had anything in my life to change, I don't think I would, even the mistakes, because. That's really the only way you can learn. It's the only way you grow, progress, is by your mistakes, your foibles, the good things as well as the bad things. We just saw a little uh, Elizabeth in National Velvet. Here is a very adult Elizabeth in a performance that was uh, won an Academy Award and also I don't know of a critic anywhere who didn't, who wasn't overwhelmed by the power of your presence in this. Here's just one scene from Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. I want to share it with our audience. There is no moment, there is no moment anymore when we could come together. Yeah, well, maybe you're right. You can't come together with nothing, and you're nothing. Snap! I looked at you tonight, and you weren't there! Bonnie, snap! And, and I'm gonna howl it out! And I'm not going to give a damn what I do, and I'm going to make the biggest goddamn explosion you've ever heard. You try and I'll beat you at your own game. Is that a threat, George, huh? That's a threat, Martha. You're going to get it, baby. Be careful, Martha. I'll rip you to pieces. You are not man enough. You haven't the guts. Total war? Total. Hmm. Uh... That's quite a maturation, quite a difference. Are those two different women, National Velvet and... Uh, oh, Who's God, yes. I mean, personally speaking. I had to... Uh, th there was no place in me that I could dig to find Martha. Um, I had to observe a lot of people, uh, friends, uh, older friends, and luscious. I changed my voice, I wore padding, um, rubber under my eyes and under my chin. Um, I walked differently. Um, I you gained weight for it too, didn't you? Uh, yeah, and I wore padding as well. Right. You tell your reader in your book, uh, Elizabeth Takes Off, that you can go to 125, 126, is that so? I, how, how much do you weigh now? Well, I'm dieting as we speak. Because the last film I did, I was told to put on 10 pounds. An opera singer you played? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was too skinny. So I'm in the middle of a diet. I need to lose about 6 pounds. Uh, but you like to be at around 120, 121, is that 122. so? 122. You also make the point that uh, uh, if, what is it about the fanny in the face? If you lose it in your body, you, a woman often, it doesn't flatter her when in her face. That's right. You don't have that problem, you say. Uh, I can get too, I can get drawn looking if I lose too much weight. Uh, because I'm compulsive, I could easily have turned around and become anorexic. It was like when I was a size four, and I shouldn't be a size four, size six is fine. It was like, why don't we try a size two? <laughs> it was like I had to slap myself to stop from... You felt you stopped becoming anorexic, did you? It was a possibility, I felt. Uh -huh. So I deliberately made myself not go under 120. Uh -huh. 
Well, what did you have for dinner this, for breakfast this morning? Brown muffin. That's Plain. That's all I've had all day. You're saying it with pain. Is that, is it, isn't it cruel to have to go through life with this kind of... Not when I know the pounds will be gone in a few days. But you used to wake up and the first thing you'd say to yourself is, what shall I eat today? Yes, but now I have so many other things to think about. You wake up now, you don't have those feelings? Mm-mm. And it's great knowing, having the confidence uh, that I will lose the weight because I was in hospital once for three months and I put on 20 of the pounds that I'd lost. And that was really depressing because I wasn't sure I could lose it again so quickly. But I stuck to the diet and I lost it just as easily, just as quickly. Can you still pig out? When I'm maintaining, I pig out once a week. You can do that without becoming yeah. the good you're... Oh, yeah. Not everybody can, as I'm sure you know. You can, I, I can only do it, uh, and I suggest only uh, anybody only do it, like for one meal on one day, uh, not two days running. And you should, I think well, when you're maintaining, weigh yourself every day. Most diets say not to, like once a week. But when I'm maintaining, I weigh once a day. And if I see I'm going up a couple of pounds, I'll be rigid with myself. Mm -hmm. When you, are you quite literally picking out once a week now? No, because now I'm dieting. Uh, but you can't allow yourself, when you get to 120, you can have yourself a real hedonistic sort oh, of yeah. gluttonous one day a week. Oh, absolutely. Uh -huh. And that would include the ingestion of what material, for example? Probably fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and gravy, and lima beans, and corn, and some wonderful dessert. Uh -huh. Lots of butter. <gasps> and you can do this without uh, rolling uh, off the uh, scale? Yeah. Not everybody can, is it? The I'm next sure. day. You know, but this you is your reward. You, you plan the day, do you? I mean, this is my day. Friday's going to be pig yeah. out day. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You did mention that uh, you were quite uh, hurt by uh, what you saw as the public preoccupation with your weight gain while you were married to Senator Warner. Uh, you also, I th you also bring up with candor uh, the jokes that were being uh, made about your weight at the time that you were very heavy. You say you got to 180 pounds. I think it may have been over that. I stopped weighing at 180. Oh, you think you went beyond 180. Um, uh, Joan Rivers was cruel to do what she did. I assume you feel that way. Uh, I think anybody that is obese is obese because of a problem of some kind and a pain and unhappiness of some kind. And to make fun of that person instead of being sympathetic toward that person, I think is a form of cruelty. Yeah. And her attempts to suggest that she was trying to give you public therapy didn't wash, did they? No. These were, as you tell your reader in the book, exclusively comments that were intended to get a laugh and not at all in any way to be interpreted as something caring and loving about you. No, yeah, they were just to get laughs. But you sail through this. You've been reading about yourself now since you were nine years old. I try not to read most of it. I haven't read uh, any of the autobiographies or anything like that. And I heard that Kitty Kelly, when she had written the last book, said, well, Elizabeth Taylor didn't sue me, so you know everything was true. Well, that's bull. I didn't read the bloody book. I didn't want to. I didn't want to get that angry. Uh -huh. But you, you can't sue in this country. But you have a docudrama about you now being planned, and uh, you're concerned about what liberties they might take with that. Uh, I don't think so. I, I stopped them once before. Because uh, I'm still alive. I'm still my own commodity. Uh -huh. When David Cobes took a break from his nursing duties, he never expected a $10 million surprise from Publishers Clearinghouse. Are you Ten kidding million? me? $10 million can be yours, too, if you enter our new sweepstakes fast. That is more than incredible. That is fantastic. Tartar Control Aqua Fresh fights tartar. It makes you feel this fresh. Only Tartar Control Aqua Fresh fights cavities, plaque, and tartar, all with one great Aqua Fresh taste.
It fights tartar. And makes you feel this fresh. Hurry in for Circuit City's 4th of July weekend sale. And save on this Magnavox VCR with remote, now a low $197. This JVC Car Stereo CD player, just $299 installed. And this Hotpoint 14.7 cubic foot refrigerator, only $324 after $125 SCE rebate. Don't miss the 4th of July weekend sale, going on now at Circuit City. Welcome to Circuit City, where service is state of the art. <laughs> More piccata sauce! Wait, this ain't paste but kind of sauce. No, it's new paste thick and chunky salsa. Big chunks of tomatoes, onions, and peppers. Perfect for dipping. And it's got something no other thick and chunky salsa has. The great taste of paste. So try new paste thick and chunky in mild, medium, and hot. Who was that pitch man anyway? I don't know, but it left us this. Pick up the thick and chunky one. Pick up the paste. To clean windows, mirrors, Formica, just dial one with Take 5, the revolutionary all-purpose cleaning system. To clean tile, leather, chrome, dial two with Take 5. To clean floors, walls, carpet, dial three with Take 5. To clean upholstery, stoves, tools, dial four with Take 5. To clean ovens, engines, driveways, dial five with Take 5. Take 5 out cleans them all. It's the only cleaner you'll ever need. Mighty Dog presents Mighty Dogs. Pound for pound, these guys use up more energy than most dogs twice their size. That's why we make Mighty Dog. It has the perfect balance of nutrients to help them be their best. Mighty Dog, it does big things for little dogs. future for you will include uh, work, you, I assume, look forward to films? Yeah, I like to work uh, every once in a while. It has to be something that I really enjoy because uh, I do so many other things. Uh, last year, I squeezed too much in one year. I almost knocked myself out. Well, Elizabeth, our time is up. I thank you for sharing with us uh, a very, very important odyssey. One that's uh, not unfamiliar to a lot of our viewers, and presumably one that uh, is still to be uh, undertaken by a number of others. I assume for those who want to take it off, you're here to say, if you can do it, they can do it. Well, I hope it does help somebody. That's why uh, I wrote the book. Because if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs>